talk a little bit about um, sensation of perception. This is an area that I have a lot of interest in. Um, part of my graduate training uh, involved uh, working a great deal with uh, some women who do some really great work in sensation of perception. In fact, the reason I'm here is because of my sensation of perception professor. Um, I had a good friend who um, died of AIDS back in the, I think about 1993, 94, somewhere in there. Um, and I had gone back to school right, af right after that, and he had gone blind from cytomegalovirus and, uh, retinitis. And as a result, I was very interested in that, so when I took sensation and perception, uh, I ended up doing, uh, asking about it, and ended up doing an entire uh, independent study on uh, HIV-related vision defects, uh, which was a really interesting um, study. It turns out there uh, are a variety of ways in which uh, different viruses can attack, attack the eye, and HIV is one of those. Uh, so anyway, that's that independent study project's what uh, got me into graduate school. So that's one of the reasons why this is one of my pet areas, because it's fun. So quick question: How many senses do you think we have? Anyone? No one. Two fly away, but you have to. Five. Five. It's the standard option, right? The taste, sight, hearing, touch. What am I missing? I always forget one. <laughs> um, Freud, actually, it's interesting. Freud thought uh, that uh, smell was the most infantile smell, and any reasonable adult shouldn't really have a good sense of smell. Does anyone know why that is? Did I tell you that? Yeah. It's cocaine habit. Yes. I actually was reading. <laughs> you can actually, if you go, you know, ev the great thing about the internet is you can find everything, and you can find his original essay ex extolling the great benefits of cocaine. Um, which is worth a read because it's really interesting because he was, he was really quite a fan. Um, <coughs> so these are some of the traditional uh, senses we talk about. It turns out we have quite a few more. Um, part of this gets into that our, when we talk about touch, touch actually has quite a few sort of subcomponents to it, uh, which includes things like propriocep our proprioception and our kinesthetic senses. So when we talk about touch, we traditionally think about, you know, when something touches our skin. But we also have the ability to perceive where our body is in 3, 3D space, um, which is our proprioception, and also when we're moving, which is our kinesthetic senses. Uh, this is actually really important information for us, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to walk without that kind of information. It's also how we're able to do things like throw a ball and catch a ball. Uh, and it turns out there's quite a bit of sensory integration in both proprioception and kinesthetic senses. So in our uh, touch senses, we also, of course, have pain and temperature, which are um, regulated. There's also in there chemoreceptors uh, for chemical burns, that sort of thing. And then finally, we also have our balance and orienting system, which is called our vestibular system. And that's really important uh, because it provides us information about where we are in 3D space. It's also what happens when we get motion sickness. It's usually because our vestibular system is registering movement and our eyes are not. How many of you get car sick? Anyone? Yeah, you probably can never read when you're in the car, right? Yeah. Well, that's because you're, if you try to read, your visual system isn't registering movement, but your vestibular system is. Uh, so if you're someone who gets motion sickness and you, for some reason, decide that the greatest thing you need to do is go on a cruise, um, which is one I don't recommend. The two things I would have to say is, one, uh, try to avoid your alcohol intake because that will make you much more susceptible to motion sickness. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but also, the best thing you can do is, if you're on a boat, is to keep your eye on the horizon. So to go out on deck and try to keep your eye on the horizon because then your visual system can see that you're moving and you're less likely to get motion sickness. Uh, if you're somebody who gets sick in the car, the front seat's better for you because you can see you get more visual information. So that's a quick introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Get some lingo out of the way. We have to talk about what the difference between sensation is and perception. So sensation is simply stimulation of one of our sense organs. So light strikes your retina, sound waves strike your ear, and that gets transduced. Perception is our experience of that. So this is the organization, identification, and interpretation of a sensation in order to form some sort of mental representation. So our perception is our experience. Sensation is simply what happens when 
physical um, information interacts with our sense organs. So light strikes the retina, sound waves uh, strike the ear, um, chemicals touch your tongue, that's what taste is, chemical odorants reach your nose. Um, all of these are ways in which sensation occurs, but our experience is perception. In between there is what we call transduction. So transduction is the conversion of physical signals from the environment into neural signals sent to the central nervous system. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time in this area, um, particularly in vision and in the auditory system. Um, certainly that's transduction is best understood in those areas, uh, particularly vision. Uh, so we have a really uh, fine sense of how uh, when light strikes your retina, a photon is captured uh, by uh, a protein in your eye and that undergoes what's called isomerization, changes the shape of that protein, uh, which then causes the generation of an action potential, uh, which is pretty remarkable. In, the he in your um, inner ear, you have what are called hair cells and as those hair cells bend, they fire action potentials and that's how we're able to hear. So all of these processes are important in understanding how our perception uh, works. So uh, stimulation of a sense organ causes transduction. Eventually that information is processed and we become aware of it and that's when we have perception. So to give you an idea again about the transduction, we get light striking the back of our retina. Uh, we have audio waves striking our ear. We'll talk more about all these processes in here. Um, pressure of uh, surface against the skin causes transduction of cells here in the skin. And then taste and smell are dissolved chemicals uh, on uh, different membranes. I want to talk briefly about synesthesia. Uh, this is kind of, it's, uh, there's never any good place to put synesthesia, so we're just going to stick it here. Uh, <laughs> synesthesia is a weird perceptual experience um, that some people have. Um, some people say it's a clear advantage. Some people kind of find it distracting. But basically, one sense evokes a second sense. And so you actually get two sensory experiences for the price of one. Uh, and there are things like they hear colors, or they actually, when they hear a sound, it makes them think they actually see colors, so they see sound. It's sort of this very interesting experience. Um, caused by, we're not sure why, actually. There's a lot of research in this area, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, one of the things I want to note is that sensation and perception are related but separate events. So what we perceive is not necessarily a direct representation of our sensations, which synesthesia is a direct example of that, where a sound invokes us to see a, to see, um, a color. And again, synesthesia is a relatively rare phenomenon. It only occurs in some people. Um, there seems to be some people who are more musically gifted because they have synesthesia, because they actually um, get more perceptual information out of sound, and so as a result have better memory for things like music. Um, so this is sound color synesthesia. Um, so they see different sounds as actually having color. So it's most often associated with music. And so the actual hue, brightness, and depth of color often change with the volume or octave, and so they actually get a second perceptual experience along with uh, the auditory experience. Questions about that? It's kind of a difficult thing to understand if it's not something you experience. I um, want to talk a little bit about the way in which we study uh, sensation and perception. This is an area we call psychophysics. And the basic idea is to take and look at the basic physics and how it results with our psychology. So it's uh, how to measure our perceptual experiences. So psychophysicists uh, are often very much uh, interested in things like detection threshold, thresholds and absolute thresholds because they tell us our ability to detect physical differences in the environment. So psycho psychophysicists, psychophysicists uh, often measure things like the minimum of amount <laughs> of stimulus needed for detection, and we call this the absolute threshold. Uh, so psychophysics are methods by which we measure the strength of a stimulus and, our obser and an observer's sensitivity to that stimulus. So we're taking a and comparing uh, the physical stimulus with our perceptual experience and trying to figure out 
uh, how sensitive our sensory systems are and how able we are to discern uh, things like color, etc. So to get a couple of pieces of psychophysics lingo out that we'll talk about in various places, the first thing is what we call the absolute threshold. This is the minimal intensity needed to just barely detect a stimulus. Usually we call the absolute threshold your ability to identify the presence of the stimulus on 50% of trial. So it's the minimum amount of stimulus required for you to detect the presence of a stimulus. So in um, sound, we're talking about the lowest volume found of a particular frequency that you can detect. For um, vision, we're usually talking about the lowest intensity light that you can detect. It's a more complicated question because uh, that changes quite a bit depending on your recent experience. So if you've been dark adapting, for example, your perceptual abilities change. Um, things like what's the minimum amount of physical stimulus you can detect on your skin, what's the minimum amount of salt you can detect in a solution, all of these are absolute thresholds. So to give you an idea about most of our approximate sensory thresholds, everyone's a little bit different. Uh, certainly our experiences can change our perceptual abilities, but uh, on a very dark, clear night, you can actually detect a candle flame from 30 miles away, provided it's the only light. <laughs> now, dare to find yourself a place to do that. Um, yeah, one of the important things about uh, vision in particular, again, has to do with uh, surrounding things like light. Anyone gone out into the country and looked at stars compared to what they're like here? Completely different experience, right? That's because there's less light pollution. Um, obviously, we would you couldn't hear a clock ticking in here because there's more going on. There's also a lot of people in here. Anyone ever been on the uh, and on an elevator and could hear either your watch or somebody else's watch ticking? Yeah. Anyone have to keep their watches in a drawer? No one besides me. All my watches are in a drawer, like in my closet, because I can hear them tick, and it drives me nuts. Uh, I actually have to sleep with the TV on because I hear every little noise, and it will make me insane. So if there's just something on, I don't care to watch, I can sleep right through it. Um, <coughs> you can actually detect um, a single fly wing, that's kind of a gross example, but um, falling on your cheek, uh, a single drop of perfume in uh, the volume of six rooms, and you can detect uh, a teaspoon of sugar dissolved in two gallons of water. Those are basic approximate sensory thresholds. Uh, this is generally what uh, the data look like in this kind of absolute threshold experiment. Um, so we have increasing physical intensity, say increased volume of a tone. Uh, you'll detect it sometimes, rarely, and then by the time you start hearing it more and more, once you cross the 50% threshold, you barely quickly, fairly quickly get to 100%. And so that point at which you get to 50% is that absolute threshold. The other thing we're interested in looking at is what's called the just noticeable difference threshold. So the absolute threshold is our ability to detect the stimulus at all. Uh, the JND is our ability to notice that a stimulus has changed. So an increase in volume, increase in brightness, a change in color, a change in tone, something like that. So it's to notice some difference uh, between two stimuli. These difference thresholds are particularly important uh, from an applied psychological perspective because we start to get interested in whether or not someone's going to notice the difference between two stimuli uh, and why that's important. So I'd give you a simple example. Uh, if you are somebody who lifts weights, I used to have this trainer that got obsessed with like getting to a specific number in, uh, in like what I could lift. And so he would add, like, I have, like, I don't know, 200 pounds on a bar. And he would add two, two and a half pound weights to each side so that I could get to whatever even number it was that day. No one notices an extra five pounds on top of 200 pounds. If you add five pounds on top of 10 pounds, you notice it right away. Okay. That's actually what's called Weber's fraction or Weber's law. The just noticeable difference of a stimulus is a constant proportion despite variations in intensity. So let's take a nice round number. 
if we say for weight for you it's 10 percent so if you're lifting 100 pounds you'd have to add 10 for 200 you'd have to add 20 etc it's a constant proportion and this is true for all senses uh, it is a constant proportion despite variations in intensity so whatever it is you have to increase it by it's a percentage of uh, the overall intensity so why is this important well this has lots of really important psychological components so for example if we are working for Kraft Foods um, and you know the government's trying to get us to reduce calorie counts and sodium counts in our food or consumers are question is how much can we change those products before someone notices the difference in taste so basically that's a just noticeable difference so if we want to reduce fat and salt in food without compromising on taste we have to figure out how much we can remove before we get an alteration in someone's uh, ability to detect that change in its taste so there are lots of different ways in which this kind of sensory information is uh, adjusted other things like um, if we're maybe computer scientists and interested in trying to study or uh, trying to develop a video game, exactly how many frames per second do we have to present before someone starts to notice that the movement becomes jerky? Right? Well, that's an important applied com component because the more frames you have, the more data you have, uh, and the harder it is for people to stream on their cell phones, right? So we want to comp compress data. That's an important psychophysics question. I do want to note quickly on salt, because I was using it as an example here. Our perception of the taste of salt actually changes with the amount of salt you consume, uh, which is really interesting. That is, the more salt you consume, the less, the less salt you taste. So if you're used to really salty food, it, it tastes less salty than it does to the rest of us, at least for me. Um, so one of the things you can actually do, and this will be more important as you get older. <coughs> I, I don't have problems with blood pressure, but I have friends that do, and they... Uh, I don't know if you've gone to the South much, but they like their salt in the South. Um, and uh, <laughs> they also have high blood pressure down there. And one of the things I find when I travel, if I eat out, because I don't put much salt in my food, stuff tastes really salty to me because I've lowered my threshold for the taste of salt. So over time, you actually change, actually change your salt taste. That is, the more you salt you eat, the less salty things taste. Um, Questions about that? I want to talk a little bit about uh, some other areas in perception. First of these is what's called sig signal detection theory. Uh, and we'll also talk about sensory adaptation. When we talk about uh, sensory signals, we're talking about a light or a sound. So these signals are perceived amongst sort of environmental background noise. We also have your brain sort of randomly fires. You know, neurons are just kind of oftentimes doing their own thing. And so every once in a while, you'll actually get an internally generated stimulus. Um, you can also sort of be listening so hard that you hear something that's not there. Um, you all have this kind of experience. At some point in school, they took you off to test your hearing, right? You still do that? Yeah. So they stick you in the library or somewhere, and you have to raise your right hand or your left hand, depending on which ear it was beeping in, right? That's basically what they were doing. You were trying to detect that signal amongst noise. That's why they put you in a quiet environment. So signal detection theory is a way by which we analyze that kind of data. So this is when which a response to a stimulus depends both on your sensitivity to the stimulus and the presence of noise and on what we call your response criterion. That is, how convinced you have to be that you heard that beep to say that you heard it. This is important because we're dealing with people, and people are strange and fussy and weird, um, and they do all sorts of crazy things. Uh, one of the things they do is they often guess, like they think they might have heard something. So someone who guesses a lot is going to end up having more what we call false alarms, which occurs when the person says, yes, I heard something, uh, when there was actually no signal present. So this takes into account our individual perceptual sensitivity. And is also useful for training a variety of professionals. So this kind of analysis is done uh, as people are learning 
different kinds of tasks, like learning how to read uh, x-rays. So radiologists will have to try to, will have to learn how to detect the presence of a breast cancer tumor uh, versus the sort of noise in an x-ray. And so we want them to have high hit rates, and we want them to have low false alarm rates. That is, we don't want them uh, sending people off for biopsies when they don't need them. So some of the ways in which we look at this, so when we talk about, we have some signal strength here, so louder sounds here, quieter sounds here, or more clear tumor here, more gray noise here. We get the number of responses someone has um, for which there is an actual signal here. We call that a hit. This is the, what we call their criterion. So anything that's above this, I'm going to say, yes, I heard something. Yes, that's a breast cancer tumor uh, in the airport. Yes, that's a gun in somebody's bag. Um, all of these are, that would be a hit if there's an actual gun. If there's no gun, we would call that a false alarm. And again, that's above this criterion level. One of the things that research has demonstrated is that over long periods of time, those people sitting at the airport screening your bag because there's never any guns in people's bags very often, their criterion tends to drift uh, upwards. That is, they uh, are more likely to miss the presence of a gun in someone's bag over time. So this is a way in which we can actually use this kind of sensory information or sensory research to try to actually have some imp important application. So as a result of that kind of research in this area, uh, people who are airport screeners now switch from one station to the other. They used to sit in screen bags all day, but now it's about every hour they change stations. So that's sort of the application of this kind of research. Last note I want to talk to you about has to do with what we call sensory adaptation. Um, sensory adaptation is that you lose sensitivity over time. So if you have the same stimulus present over a long period of time, your sensory system stop responding to its presence. Uh, that is, you have adapted to its presence. So we call it sensory adaptation. So, um, and it's a basic cellular process. The cells of your sensory system so simply stop responding to the constant presence of a stimulus because it's simply constantly there. Um, the reason why, so to give you an example, any of you who wear glasses, over time, you don't generally see your glasses, particularly the inside here because it's just constantly there and constantly in the same place. Same thing if you have a spot on your glasses. You sometimes won't notice it for the longest period of time. <coughs> we are pretty um, quick to adapt to the presence of smells. So um, have you ever walked into somebody's house and thought, do they know it smells like this? Anyone else had that happen? Or have you gone away from vacation and come back and been like, does my house really smell like this? Um, anyone who has pets usually has that experience. Um, because you have adapted to that sort of smell over long periods of time. To give you some examples, you wonder, people wonder why orange juice tastes so terrible after brushing your teeth. You know that toothpaste is sweetened, right? Most people don't realize that, but it actually has sweetener and it has xylitol in it. Um, and as a result, you've actually adapted out these sweet receptors in your mouth, in your tongue. And so, you no longer taste the sweet part of the orange juice, you only taste the bitter part of the orange juice. That's why it always tastes so terrible after you brush your teeth. Um, people who put on too much cologne, anyone had, anyone, oh, yes, this is, I call this, I've started calling this the Axe body spray phenomenon. Um, let me give you a quick hint, people. Um, a body spray is not a shower. Um, it is not a, re, a replacement for that. But people will spray stuff on, and they'll go off and do something else. And as a result, their nose, no, no longer notices the presence of whatever it is they've sprayed on, so they spray on more, and then maybe some more. <laughs> Anyone had this experience with friends? Uh, the other things are things like the new, a new car smell. If you buy a new car, it'll smell new to you for a very short period of time, but people will keep getting into it, telling you it smells like a new car, uh, but you will have adapted to that. <coughs> Any questions about sensory adaptation? We're actually going to see sensory adaptation uh, as an important component of understanding vision, probably on Wednesday. Um, but we'll start uh, with some basics about the visual system. First of these is how we measure visual acuity, which is our ability to see fine detail. So when we talk about people with 20-20 vision, this is 
someone who uh, can see 20 feet away what people know most people can see from 20 feet away um, whereas somebody with 2200 vision can see at 20 feet what most people can see 200 feet away which is actually the criterion for legal blindness and people with say 2010 vision can see at 20 feet what most people can see at 10 feet and that's kind of how that visual acuity works this is called a Snell and eye chart. Um, I'm sure you've all seen these at your eye doctor. It's one of the ways in which we can test visual acuity. Uh, one of the things we also look at is what's called contrast sensitivity. So acuity is actually related to contrast. So this down here would be 100% contrast, whereas up here we would have much lower contrast, so it's gray on white. This is what we call a contrast sensitivity curve. That's actually, and we'll, I'll show you another one of these here in a second. Um, no, I won't. Basically, most people can see within this contrast curve. So that is, uh, you can see small stimuli when it's 100% um, contrast, but you can't see that same stimulus when it's very low contrast. As we start to get older, we lose our ability to discern contrast, so this gets harder and harder. So older adults really need high contrast stimuli. Um, this is particularly troubling. As you get older, restaurant menus get harder to read uh, because restaurant menus, they love to use like parchment and gray type and you know red type and it gets very difficult to read as you get older, um, particularly when you start talking about low illumination conditions. We'll talk more about that in a bit. <coughs> the stimulus in the visual system is visible light, the small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. Our perception is related to a couple of different aspects. The color of what we see is dependent on the wavelength of light. So when we talk about wavelength, you have to remember a single waveform. talk about wavelength, we're talking about the distance here, which in light is denoted as lambda for some reason. Um, but that's the wavelength. You can see that here. Wavelength in light is measured in nanometers. So we talk about a 480 nanometer light or a 580 nanometer light sort of thing. Wavelength is associated with hue or color. Amplitude is associated with brightness. So again, amplitude is the height of the wave. We see similar phenomenon with sound waves. We'll talk more about that later. So in our visual system, uh, those of us with, uh, those people who have relatively normal color vision, uh, there are three different photoreceptors that absorb light at three different uh, distinct wavelengths, which allows us to see in color. And then amplitude has to do with brightness. Brightness is also related to um, how many photons are being released by a light source, which is a separate and then purity has to do with saturation. So when we talk about the purity of a color, we're talking about saturated or desaturated. <coughs> so uh, to give you a pretty simple idea of this, red would be a pure color, pink, actually desaturated red. Because it's a less pure form of red, it has more white light in it. Which is why when you mix paints, if you add white paint to red paint, you get pink paint because it's reflecting back more white light, that it is a less pure color. Color mixing gets more complicated in other ways. This is the simplest of that. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum from gamma rays to radio waves. Um, we can see this very small portion uh, from about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. Some species uh, can see ultraviolet light. Snakes, for example, have ultraviolet receptors, um, whereas some avian species, in particular uh, raptors, hawks, eagles, that sort of thing, can see into the infrareds. But we're stuck with our you know, relatively decent set of uh, light rays. And then smaller rays are things like x-rays and, and 
radio waves are out much larger than that. So all this gets accomplished uh, starting at the eye. Light passes through the cornea, the primary um, responsibility of the cornea is for refraction. That is, it bends light rays so that we can actually see. So light rays are bent by the cornea. They then travel through the pupil, which is the in the center of the iris. The iris is the is a, an actual ring of muscle uh, which surrounds the pupil. The iris either expands or contracts, which increases or decreases the pupil size. Then goes through the lens. Uh, the lens is able to change shape so that we can focus on either near or far objects or what we call distal and proximal stimuli. So we call that accommodation. So the ability to switch our focus from near to far is this process of accommodation. And then light strikes the retina, at which point, at which point we get phototransduction. So accommodation is uh, the process by which we keep things focused on our retina. So what happens is the lens uh, can uh, change thickness. So there's a set of muscles called the ciliary muscles that pull the lens tight or let it be loose. When you're focusing on something close up, uh, those muscles are pulling the lens tight. When you're looking at something far away, they're more relaxed. One of the problems with that is people who spend a lot of time on close-up work, so people that read a lot, spend a lot of time on their computers, oftentimes can develop myopia. That is, you can actually, over time, wear out those uh, muscles and end up needing glasses. We call it grad school myopia. Um, most people eventually, everyone will need glasses eventually. Um, doesn't matter if you've had LASIK surgery or not, eventually you're just going to get old. Um, and get what's called presbyopia. We'll talk about that in a moment. You lose this ability to accommodate. <coughs> the retina then is the light sensitive tissue lining the back of the eyeball. Light actually travels through a series of translucent cells uh, before they strike the photoreceptors. Those photoreceptors are embedded in a highly rich uh, vascular environment called the pigment, called the pigment epithelium. Uh, and they use a lot of energy and they use a, uh, it's one of the most highly vascular surfaces in the, in the body. And so anything that goes wrong with the blood can actually disrupt uh, vision as a result of that. I want to take a quick note on the relationship between your pupil response and your ability to focus a clear image on the retina. And this is important because I know some of you lay in bed with lights off reading on your iPads, your phones. Terrible idea. You should always read in bright light, although I do this too, so I'm not the only one that's guilty of this. Um, I see my colleagues actually working at their desks with lights off in their office. It's a terrible idea. Uh, the reason for that is uh, if your pupils are wide open because it's dark, uh, you actually can't focus as easily. Uh, so there's this very interesting study of a tribe called the Moken, um, and there's a couple of things I wanted to point out about this. The reason we can't see underwater is because of the refractive index difference between water and your pupil is not sufficient for us to be able to focus. The refractive difference between air and our pupil, or sorry, and our cornea, is enough so that light rays are bent and we can actually focus and see under like, and see, which is the reason why we have to wear goggles underwater because it reinstates that air cornea difference. The Moken actually have trained themselves to constrict their pupils so far that they can actually focus underwater. So they're actually fishermen, and they actually hand fish, and they can actually see underwater. So what you can see is uh, light being reflected by the cornea. When you have your pupil wide open, you end up with this much larger amount of light, and so it has to work harder to try to focus. And so what you end up with without um, that um, cornea difference between air and uh, air in the cornea, when you're underwater, you don't get that bending, so you get this large, what we call, blur circle. What they've been able to do is constrict their pupils so far that they end up with a much less, blur, much less blurry zone, and so they can actually see pretty well. The take-home message, then, is that <coughs> if your pupils are open because it's dark, it's much harder for your um, lens to actually try to constrict enough to focus light on the retina. And so you actually want to always read in bright light. So one of the things 
Uh, we talk about our refractive errors. This has to do with a number of things that can cause refractive errors. It can be the shape of your eye. It can be uh, difficulty with your lens. Your cornea can change shape over time. <coughs> so you can end up with myopia, which is nearsightedness, or hyperopia, which is farsightedness. Um, so we'll get back to myopia and hyperopia. So if you're looking at something out here in the environment, it actually gets reversed and is upside down and backwards on your retina. Um, normal vision, it gets focused at the right point. If you're nearsighted, uh, it ends up getting focused in front of the retina. If you're farsighted, it ends up getting focused behind the retina. <coughs> so we fix that with corrective lenses. Um, so normal vision, it's focusing right here where it's supposed to. Uh, uncorrected nearsighted vision, it's focusing in front, so we use a concave lens to focus us on the appropriate point. For people who are farsighted, uh, we use a convex lens to focus it on the appropriate point. So people who are farsighted, like the name says, can see things that are far away, uh, but can't focus on things up close as well. People who are nearsighted can see things that are up close, but not far away. Now, as we get older, we all start to get a little bit farsighted because our lens can no longer change its shape in order to focus on things up close. This is why your parents have probably started doing this with their phone. Anyone have that phenomenon with their parents? Eventually, their sh arms will be too short, and they will have to do like I have and finally get progressive lenses. Um, because that's something that LASIK surgery cannot fix. Uh, LASIK surgery restructures your cornea, um, so you can have perfectly fine, um, you can fix your myopia, but it will not fix your hyperopia. Astigmatism is a whole other issue, usually due to a misshaped cornea. So instead of having a spherical shape, it has a more oval shape. And as a result, those of us with astigmatism, uh, we end up with our vision being off, like, uh, it's blurry at sort of an angle, is the best way to put it. Uh, so this is a sort of quick astigmatism test. So if you look sort of right here in the center, and one of these is more blurry than the other, then you may have some kind of astigmatism. Mine's terrible. Um, to it's now terrible enough to the point that I, like I have to spe like contacts have to be special ordered. One of the things about astigmatism that I do want to note is those of you who have an astigmatism and wear toric lenses. Toric lenses are weighted, so they always stay lined up. So somebody with an astigmatism, their lenses always have to be in the same orientation. Uh, whereas someone without astigmatism, their contacts can just float around. Doesn't matter how where they're oriented. Um, but the problem with people with contacts uh, who have an astigmatism is because they're weighted, if you wear them quite a bit, your cornea will actually keep changing shape. What happens is that weighted part of the um, toric lens, your cornea can't uh, gather as much oxygen as it needs to, and so it grows more down at the bottom, so you end up changing your, um, pres uh, your prescription. So uh, the cornea out here, which is the part of your you know, eye that interacts with the environment, has no blood supply. And as a result, it gathers all of its oxygen from the environment. And so if you keep it covered with a plastic contact lens, it can actually change the shape of your uh, cornea over time, particularly, again, if you have an astigmatism. The other thing about the cornea that's something you probably all noticed is it ha is highly innervated with pain receptors. Uh, which is why it's very painful if you get something in your eye or if you scratch your cornea or are stupid like I am and didn't wear sunglasses one day when I was outside working and sunburnt my cornea. Don't do that. It's very painful. Um, <coughs> but the third thing about the cornea that's also, I think, very interesting is it's the fastest growing tissue in the body and your cornea actually replaces itself about every other day. So if you do scratch your cornea, it's going to be better within you know, 12 to 14 hours. So um, phototransduction occurs in the retina, and there are two types of photoreceptor cells in the retina that contain light-sensitive pigments that transduce light into neural impulses. The 
cones detect color, operate under normal daylight conditions, and allow us to focus on fine detail. The fovea is an area of the retina where vision is the clearest and there are no rods at all. So the whole goal of accommodation is to focus light in this area called the fovea, which is within an area called the macula. So the cones are really operating for most of what we think of as vision. So fine detail, recognizing objects, recognizing letters, reading, recognizing somebody's face, all of that's being done primarily by the cones. The rods work more uh, under low light conditions, so if it's night, your rods will be more active. They're also more involved in movement, but their primary vision, their primary sort of area of responsibility is night vision. Um, because they are so sensitive to light, they work better in low light conditions. In fact, they only work in low light conditions. Um, this is the reason why when you get out with less light pollution, you can see uh, more stars because it's actually the rods that are helping to do that. So just to give you an idea of their distribution, we have the central fovea. This is again where all of our detailed vision is. Highly densely packed with cones. In fact, only cones in here. Uh, and then the rods are more dis distributed throughout the rest of the retina. Again, gives you an idea of what they look like. A little closer look. Uh, you can see why they get their name, simply because of their structural shape. The cones are a little shorter. Just like cones, the rods are much longer. So the retina has l additional layers of cells, including bipolar cells and the retinal ganglion cells, in addition to the rod and cone layers. We won't get into much detail on that, but light passes through those cells before uh, striking uh, the photoreceptors. You should also note you have a blind spot, which is the location of the visual field that produces no sensation in the retina because there's no rods nor cones, because this is where the ganglion cells exit the eye and form the optic nerve. We don't notice the blind spot for two reasons. Uh, one, we have two eyes, and so the corresponding visual field is covered in our other eye. Uh, but you should do the blind spot demonstration in your textbook um, where you can actually, you have to close one eye, focus on an object, and then move your the paper closer and further away. And you'll actually see things disappear into that blind spot. The reason even with one eye closed we don't notice the blind spot is the brain fills in uh, the surrounding area, with, so the missing information with information from the surrounding area. Um, so basically your brain's photoshopping uh, the blind spot out. All right, so we will pick up on color perception on Wednesday. Any questions? All right, go out and enjoy the sunshine. <laughs>